All right, I've toned my paper, I've put in my line drawing, now I'm ready to start shading. Um, the materials I'm going to be using are a Conte 2B pencil, this is a Pierre Noir. I've got a couple of little eraser holders, uh, these are my hard erasers. That's going to help me erase out details, highlights. Um, I've got a kneaded eraser, that's going to be for larger, soft erasing. Uh, some blending stumps. This is stylistic choice, I really don't need them, but uh, it'll help me get smoother shading. And then to erase, I've got my chamois cloth. So the first step is going to be the same as last week. I'm going to find my light breaks, find their shapes, and using either a fuzzy or sharp line, I'm going to indicate whether I'm looking at a body shadow, which have soft transitions, or a cast shadow. So here we have a body shadow, and here we have a cast shadow. It's going to be sharp. Then we have a body shadow that's running like this. Everybody, be as specific about the shape of your light break as you can from the very beginning. Don't simplify. You spend a lot of time working out the contours on the outside, work out the contour on the inside. This is pretty complicated. We've got a body shadow here and then a wedge here, which is sharp because there's a cast shadow running off that form. Then it flows into another body shadow here. I've chosen a photo that has very, very clear light breaks, that has clear core shadows, that has clear reflected lights. Pay attention to what kind of image you choose. In the classroom, I make sure that the models are properly lit. When you're working photographs, it's up to you. You decide whether the model is properly lit or whether the shadows are too dark <clears throat> or too light, if there's some kind of distracting secondary light, which in a lot of these image, images from New Masters Academy is the case. Um, so we have a light break going this way. And then here we have a little hiccup that's caused by the separation between the adductor group and your quadriceps muscles here. So no simple straight lines when you're doing the light break. Pay very close attention. So here, when the leg is straight, the skin around the kneecap tends to get kind of crumpled up a little bit, which creates a very complex, wiggly looking light break. Here it's going, okay, more or less straight, but then we've got a little hiccup here. <clears throat> okay, um, here we've got a very, very clear, nice light break running along the bicep, then running along whatever this muscle is, I guess the brachioradialis muscle, or the brachialis muscle, excuse me. Um, then running along this way, running like this. Um, here we have a really nice, beautiful cast shadow. Cast shadows always create all kinds of really interesting Papa, shapes. Are you done? No, I'm not done. I'm not done. Sweetheart, I'm not done. Okay. All right, so we've got a cast shadow here, running this way, like this, running like this, running this way, running like that. I really should put a lock on my studio, but then he's going to be banging on the door, wondering why the door is locked. So I think this is going to work out better and more entertaining for all of you. Um, okay. I think I found my light breaks. Um, I paid attention whether they're soft or sharp. The next step is to shade a little bit. Everybody, when you're working on toned paper, you're already starting off with a dark value. Ideally, the paper should be 50% gray, and depending on how dark the shadows are, you might only need to shade the core shadow. You might only, let's put it this way, or the shadows might need to be darker. So it really, it's dependent on the image. Uh, in this case, the shadows are a little bit darker than this midtone, a little tiny bit. I'm going to shade down a little tiny bit, a little tiny bit. Guys, when you go over this with a blending stump, you'll find that the pencil goes darker. So really at the beginning, go really light. Uh, I forgot about the little light break here and the fact that there's a cast shadow here. This is really pretty right here, this little area. And then we have a cast shadow on this side. shade a little tiny bit and then by the way the softness of the light break is also going to vary so in some places where you have a very gradually turning form the softness of the light break is going to be well really soft here where we have a relatively kind of blocky shape it's still cylindrical it's still round um, but it's more blocky there's a more abrupt angle shift 
or shift and plane, uh, the light break is going to become not quite as fuzzy. It's still going to be fuzzy though. Fuzzier than the cast shadow. So we have a cast shadow here, it's going to be sharp, sharp, and then on this side I'm paying attention to the fact that this part here is a body shadow. It needs to be soft. Okay, so the breasts are round, we've got a shadow here, and then we have a really interesting, and I like cast shadows, uh, some artists don't like them. I enjoy them. Um, the fact that there's a sharp cast shadow here. Uh, okay, so we've got another light break here. We've got a soft edge here. Okay, so again, this is a stylistic choice, but um, I recommend all of you guys use your blending stumps and smooth out your shading. A little bit uh, again you'll find that the value goes a little bit darker when you blend and then adjust your body shadows to get the appropriate softness of edge don't do it with the cast shadows though don't do that cast shadows are sharp see working on midtone Paper is a much faster way of achieving a full range of value. You'll see it in a second. So what usually takes a tremendous amount of patience, control of pressure, uh, happens almost, well, almost automatically in your tone paper drawing. Uh, okay, so we forgot about the light breaks on the face. Look, same exact stuff. Uh, we've got a body shadow here. It's pretty abrupt here uh, because the cheekbone has a sharp angle to it. Uh, the cheekbone goes a little bit softer. I am never forgetting what kind of shadow I am seeing though. Uh, on the bottom of the lip we have a cast shadow. Underneath the nose we have a cast shadow. On the side of the nose we have a body shadow here and on the opposite side we have a little cast shadow here. <clears throat> Forgot hair, but uh, I guess we'll make her bald right now. We'll add hair later uh, when I'm done with the drawing. So at the end of the demo, you'll see a photo of this thing. Hopefully, I'll have added added hair. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, okay, so that's step one. I've separated my shadows from my lights. I was specific about the shape of the light break and the harder softness of the light break. Let's whip out our kneaded eraser and start erasing out. Everybody, whenever you're working on tone paper, shade a little bit, erase a little bit. Shade a little bit more, erase a little more. Always be pulling from the midtone out towards your extremes of light and dark. So if you needed an eraser, take a little bit. You can use the entire piece, but usually I'll take a marble size like this, roll it around a little bit to warm it up. Make sure you've got a round tip like this that you can control, and then start erasing out a little bit. Don't start working towards the extremes. Really, all I'm doing is trying to get a little bit of contrast between my lights and my darks. Just a little bit, so that I, I can start seeing the contrast between them. Value is very relative. I don't know how bright something is until I can compare it to the shadow. So by pulling out in both directions, it allows me to get my values, get my values right. It's only through comparison that I can actually do that. Um, if I shade all the way down without adding white, because I'm comparing my shadows to the gray, I'll end up going to dark in the shadows, and then by the time I add my white, I realize that instead of shadows, they look like tunnels. They'll have carved in, they'll look like holes. Okay, so always work from the midtone out. In this technique, uh, that kind of stuff is obviously, obviously correctable. You can always lighten a shadow, you can always make adjustments, but uh, this technique is very good as a training method for techniques that are less flexible. So by being systematic in this technique, it trains you to be systematic in techniques that you can't correct, such as the te technique next week, which is harder to correct, or watercolor, or paint. This method is exclusively, almost exclusively used in art schools because it's a fantastic training method. It's very flexible, very easy to correct. Um, is it used much out of art school? I don't know, probably not. Okay, uh, so here I'm gonna start pulling out a little bit. Whenever I see halftone, I'm just going to let it be the gray of the paper. Though I think this halftone is not quite in the right place. Oh, 
Okay, so I've erased that a little bit. Now that I can see the appropriate contrast, now it's time to get specific about the other properties of my body shadow and my cast shadow. So for body shadow, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a core, we're looking for a reflected light. So let's see, we've got a round shape here. It's very clear in this photo. Uh, this is one of the images that is very well lit and makes it very, very easy to see where the core shadows are. If your image doesn't have it, find one that does. Ultimately, with enough skill, experience, you'll be able to take a very poor image that's lit really badly and add those things that the camera has erased, has simplified. Okay, so we have a core shadow that's running next to the light break here. This way, going like this, running across this way. All I'm doing is focusing on my core shadows right now. There's a core shadow here, really clear core shadows here. By the way, and I missed the shape of the light break here, going this way, like that. Uh, again, this technique is very flexible. I can correct, change things around very quickly. Um, but try to get it right at the beginning. Put in your core shadows. All right, uh, let's use our blending stump. Um, again, be careful how much value you put down. You'll find that the blending stump darkens a little bit. Uh, it smears the charcoal particles. So you actually end up going a little bit darker than what you put down at the beginning. Uh, maybe my camera isn't picking up on that, but uh, you can see that had I gone actually as dark as what I saw, by the time I added the blending tool, I will have created a hole. Okay, so what else am I looking for? I'm looking for stronger darks at the beginning of all of my core shadows. Going a little bit darker here, like this. Again, I'm looking for the things that make a cast shadow look like a cast shadow things that make a core shadow, body shadow, look like a body shadow. Uh, I'm not focused on details right now. I'm focused just on getting things to look really solid and very, very, very round. Everything else will come later. All the little half tones, separation between muscles, uh, the definition in the ribcage. Don't throw yourself into that at the beginning. That's a mistake. It's a mistake. Think about the big form at the very beginning. It's a little bit like sculpting, right? So you start off with big shapes and then little by little work towards the smaller shapes. You have to be systematic in that way because if you throw yourself into the smaller shapes, quite often what happens is the form underneath doesn't look three-dimensional and then you're going to have a collection of spots, a collection of random surface detail with absolutely not absolutely, but uh, not enough roundness underneath. So see if you can sculpt the form. Be really systematic. I try to draw the same every single time, by the way. I try to go through the same process. Uh, do I always succeed? No. Uh, is it boring? Oh my god, he starts the same way every single time. Well listen, this isn't the creative part this method, that's not where the creativity comes in. Right? Uh, nobody should be creative in their craft of figure drawing. The creativity comes from the composition, the pose, um, many, many other things that go beyond just the simple craft of drawing a figure. Uh, don't get creative in the process. Really, ideally, all the stuff I'm talking about, everything in this class, ultimately, should become completely second nature, so when you're drawing, you're not even thinking about it anymore. Um, which leads your brain free to actually think about the stuff that's actually important. What you're trying to say as an artist, the creativity, the composition, right? Uh, so hopefully you guys can see that our forms are becoming increasingly 3D now that I've checked off almost, almost all of the properties of light logic. Uh, the only thing is missing, really, I mean, other than surface detail and a lot of stuff, is, uh, is my reflected lights, are my reflected lights. Uh, guys, reflected lights cannot be as bright as a direct light, so use your eraser, but use it gingerly. 
with ginger, with restraint. Okay. Just a little tiny bit. Again, this is dependent on how much ambient light there is. Uh, you guys, again, choose an image where you can see reflected light. Um, here the reflected light is very, very strong because it's bouncing off this really, really bright breast. So here it's going to be really bright. Uh, here the reflected lights are coming from whatever reflections are outside the image. Um, so here the reflected light doesn't go quite as bright. And then here the reflected light is very muted because the reflected light is being blocked by this leg. It's still there. It's still there, but it's going to be darker. So there's no strict rule for how bright a reflected light needs to be. However, it needs to be there. It needs to happen in order for the forms to appear three-dimensional. Okay, I don't have a full range of values on the light in the darks yet. Um, before I do that, I need to start pushing a little bit of value in the light. Again, I'm always jumping back and forth between my shadows and lights, shading a little bit, erasing a little bit, shading a little bit more, erasing a little bit more. Okay, now it's time to start going brighter. I'm going to continue using my kneaded eraser. I'm going to start erasing out even more. Uh, at this point I'm going to start thinking about surface detail. So we have half tones. Uh, for your half tones you can use a dirty stump. Use a dirty stump to create a little bit of value Let's see, maybe this side's a little bit dirtier. You can make very, very subtle adjustments in value. I don't know why this shoulder is so sharp. Shouldn't be. Looks almost like a robot. It's a little more rounded. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. So I'm going to start racing out. Uh, I can start switching to my hard eraser anywhere I have sharp edges. So we've got some sharp erasing that needs to be done here along the edge of the form. I can start doing that. Hold off with your hard eraser until you really need it though. Really your hard eraser is for little tiny erasing edges, so stuff like this. Um, in this case, uh, all the light is more or less focused here on her body and then her head and her legs go a little bit darker. Uh, this technique is very, very good for getting these kind of very large, subtle light effects. So we've got some really subtle distinctions of value in the abdomen. Look, I can use my charcoal pencil for that. So for instance, to start distinguishing between the belly button, obviously, and then there's a little furrow going this way that separates the abdominal muscles. I've got two bundles, the rectus abdominis muscle, and then the separation between the rectus abdominis and the external oblique. Here. We've got some rib cage differentiation. So um, this is the time to do it. I'm trying to avoid making the half tones too dark. Guys, if half tones start going as dark as the shadows, they're gonna start falling through, they're gonna start they're gonna start looking like shadows on the form. Don't do that to yourself, please. As you guys can see, uh, what would have taken you quite a long time just working on white paper gets very quickly resolved with tone paper. I'm not done with this drawing, obviously not, uh, but I've gotten pretty far. So now I can start working with my hard eraser. The hard eraser is going to allow me to go a little bit brighter. So we've got some highlights here. Got that really nice sharp cast shadow here that I really like. I'm really enjoying. We got some highlights on her hip here, going this way. Uh, we have the separation between the tensor fascia latte and the sartorius muscle running right here. Um, all this stuff 
we'll get to when we get to anatomy. It's going to be very exciting times when we do that. Um, sharpen up your cast shadows. Yeah, there's lots of artists that deliberately eliminate cast shadows. They try to avoid sharp edges. Um, why? Because if you're not careful, quite often cast shadows, if put in the wrong place, will eat into the form, will make the form feel kind of flat. However, uh, I personally think the cast shadows are really pretty. They can be very, very dramatic. Uh, I'm a big fan of film noir. I love cast shadows. German Expressionism makes uh, really good use of cast shadows, shadows period. So, um, I think cast shadows are a good thing. They're an additional complication on the figure. Uh, don't get rid of them. All right. Okay, so really the last step is to start going into our darks. Be careful not to punch through the form by making your core shadows, your cast shadows, pure black. Um, there are a few par parts of her that are really black, her hair. All right, so notice her hair goes significantly darker than even the very darkest of the cast shadows. So go dark, get your full range of values, but limit your very darkest darks to where you actually need them, which is her hair. Detail here. All right, uh, so I'm going to work on this a little tiny bit more. I think. Okay, so I worked on this drawing a little more. Uh, I got it a little bit more refined. Um, let's finish this thing up uh, really quickly. Uh, a few things to tell you. Uh, so first of all, try to push the contrast absolutely as strong as you can make it. Uh, this technique tends to be a little bit on the gray side, depending on the quality of your paper. If you use good quality paper, by the way, you're going to get better results. Um, really think about the value transitions in the lighter area. They are very, very subtle. So the fact that we see a little bit of the iliac crest here, right, and then there's a little slight half tone there. Try to think three-dimensionally, think about where the light is coming from, and really sculpt your values. Try to keep the value moving anywhere, everywhere. Uh, pay attention, any place where there's no value transition is an area that's going to end up looking kind of flat. So uh, let's go through this with our blending stump and make sure that there's value transition absolutely everywhere. I'm looking in the half tones here. Right, uh, there's a slight transition between the collarbone and the front of the chest. Right, uh, there's no line here. Right, I'm going to eliminate it a little bit. I'm going to sharpen up the cast shadows. Again, this technique is an excellent way to study form, to really focus on value, getting the strongest range of contrast. Um, it'll break you from the habit of working too light. Uh, that seemed to be an issue with some of the students, some of you guys, um, is that uh, you were a little bit timid. Um, in this case, because this technique is so flexible, correctable, it'll train you to really throw your weight into the values. Uh, it's very easy to adjust sharp and soft edges. So uh, this is a really, really good technique to learn how to paint. Um, and quite often, this type of drawing is called charcoal painting because this is just about as close as you can get to painting without actually painting. Right? Uh, we can make big value adjustments. Uh, we can go really subtle with the values, the forms, in a way that just about no other drawing material can. Um, what else? So as I was saying, this technique, if we're not careful, goes a little bit gray. If you're finding that you need one additional step up. So you're racing, erasing, 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 and it's just not going brighter, right? So for instance, let's say there's a really bright highlight on the breast here, like here, right? Uh, you can switch to your heart eraser, erase out as much of the charcoal underneath as possible. <coughs> and you'll find that 
because the paper is staying with the charcoal a little bit, it's not going to go brighter. In that case, and only in that case, are you permitted to add a little bit of white. So uh, let's add a little tiny bit of white chalk. Of course, I don't have it in front of me. Let me grab it. Uh, okay. So I'm going to use this Carbofello chalk pencil. Uh, it's nice and soft. It's a nice dense white. Make sure you erase out as much of the material underneath as possible. Otherwise, you're not going to get a strong white. If I go here directly over the charcoal, it just mixes some kind of third tone. It gets kind of messy. Only put your white where you absolutely cannot go brighter. All right, so this is not an excuse to go crazy with your white. So this little bright highlight on the nose, that's going to give you just a little bit more pop. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you guys remember from the first part of the demo when I was toning the paper, the very last step where you put in darkest darks, so that's going to be a few spots. Right? Uh, don't blend it out with your stump, keep it crispy. Because with a blending, the blacks go a little bit gray. Right? Uh, what else? Uh, I'm going to call this drawing more or less done. Um, you can also start dealing with the background. So I haven't finished the feet, but for instance, I would include the cast shadows here to ground the figure a little bit. Don't leave the figures floating in empty space, by the way. Uh, that's an important principle. Um, if the background is a bit lighter, you can use your eraser to lighten the background. That's going to help the forms pop a little bit. Or, I can darken the background a little bit. That's going to give me an additional range of contrast. Okay, everybody. Uh, I'm done with this drawing. Uh, I might refine it a little bit more before I take a photo, but um, I'm going to call this drawing a success.